All right. Okay, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. This is, like I said, our very first virtual Rain Barrel workshop. So uh, we are very excited to have you here. We love to be doing these face-to-face, -face, but because of the circumstances, it's been almost a year since we've been able to do a Rain Barrel workshop. So we're really excited to have this opportunity to do one, even though we're just having to accommodate and change our ways just a little bit. So everybody should have received their rain barrel and their blue bag with all of their supplies. So definitely have those nearby. Before we really get started with a little bit of information about rain barrels and then we'll move into the assembly part. Just remember if you have any questions during this time, feel free to type it into the chat or while we're actually working through the assembly, if you have any questions about that particular step, feel free to unmute yourself and ask if you need some clarification. We definitely wanna make sure at the end of this workshop that you have your barrel ready to go and ready to get set up. At the very end of our presentation, we'll also have time for questions and we've included our email addresses just in case anyone would like to contact us that way. So before we really get started with the information on rain barrels and the assembly instructions, we're gonna go ahead with a couple of quick introductions. Hi everyone, I'm Jane Maganot. I'm a Washington County Extension Agent here in Washington County, um, and I'm a stormwater agent. Um, I have a unique position of uh, being soft funded, which means I'm grant funded. I'm paid through uh, different municipalities to provide uh, mandated uh, public education and outreach for 20 cities in the area um, that do stormwater education. Um, I've been living in Northwest Arkansas and doing this job for about 11 years, and I have a small diversified organic farm down in Winslow, so you can always find us at a farmer's market um, and uh, yeah that's it I'm happy to be here absolutely and my name is Sarah Spengler I am also a county extension agent I'm working on water quality so I'm pretty new to the extension service I actually just started back in January so it's been so nice to have Jane to mentor me and really help me find my way here um, I grew up in Southwest Missouri, and I've always been working in the waterways, so it's been a passion of mine, and I'm just really excited for this opportunity. So uh, I'm working specifically with Washington County and Benton County uh, and the surrounding areas on the prevention of non-point source pollution in the Illinois River and the Beaver Reservoir watersheds. So I'm not sure if, um, you know, not everyone is very familiar with these terms, but there's point and there's non-point source water pollution. So those are the two really general types of water pollution. And so point source pollution is the type that you can actually follow it back to its source. You know who is responsible for that. So let's say there's a pipe and you can actually follow it back to where it's coming from and you know the person who's responsible. So a lot of this comes from places like power plants, whenever there is an issue there. Uh, we have wastewater treatment plants potentially, and we have oil pipelines as well as oil tankers and oil rigs. And we know who to go to when that type of water pollution happens and say, hey, you're responsible for this. You need to be taking care of this issue. So we know who to go to for remediation with point source pollution. Now, with non-point source pollution, which is what I'm specifically working on in these watersheds, it's much more dispersed and diffuse, and it's a lot harder to really know where it's coming from. So litter is one that a lot, most people are very familiar with. It's very obvious, you see it, but the thing is to go back and actually look at a plastic bottle or a piece of trash in the waterway and to know really who is responsible for that is very difficult. It could have come from a trash can that blew over and that ended up going down the storm drain and to creeks and streams. So we really don't know where it's coming from specifically. It also are, you know, the type of pollution where pet waste that gets left along riverways or vehicles that are leaking automotive fluids, um, overused pesticides and fertilizers. Whenever rainstorms happen, they wash that into our waterways, but you can't really tell exactly who to go to and say, hey, you need to take care of this issue. So 
by educating folks on what non-point source pollution is and what they can do in their lives to prevent it. We're hoping that in these two watersheds, we can have a big impact. So Jane is going to tell us a little bit more about the two watersheds and how these types of pollution end up in our waterways. Um, okay, so this is a map of Benton in Washington County, um, Washington in the south, Benton up north. And uh, just to give you guys an idea of where, where our water comes from and where it flows to is the green area is the Illinois River watershed. So a watershed is an area of land that drains water to a common point. Um, thinking of it like a shower, um, when the uh, shower's on, it hits the back of the bathtub, all that water is going to flow down the drain. If it hits the front of the bathtub, it's all going to go down that same drain. No matter where the water falls in that bathtub, it's all going to the same point. And that's kind of how a watershed works. And so the uh, the green shaded area is the Illinois River. Um, so if it rains in that area, it's going to flow to the Illinois River. Um, and the same on the, the eastern side of the counties is the Beaver uh, Lake Reservoir. Um, and so those that water flows into Beaver Lake. And if you go up to um, to Bentonville, it's split kind of half and half. Um, some of it's going up to the Elk River um, to the north of Missouri. And so when it rains, the water falls from the sky and it lands into our, our ground. But then what happens to it? About half of it's going to soak into the ground. Seems like it's frozen, Sarah. I don't know if you can keep going. Can you click again? There you go. Half yeah. of it goes into the ground and then um, about a little less than half goes up into the air through evaporation and about 10% of it runs across the surface. This is a natural ground setting. And this is a natural ground setting. There is some development, there's some houses, some roads, but for the most part, this, when it rains, about 50% of this water is going to soak into the ground. But um, if you look at this area, there's a lot of green areas, but think about all the roads, the parking lots, the buildings, the driveways, the sidewalks, that area cannot soak in rain. It's called impervious surfaces. So that area can't absorb water um, and that's gonna be what generates stormwater runoff. Um, so as that water hits that hard surface, it's gonna start running um, into the closest place it can, it can go down, downhill somewhere. And it's gonna take us into um, um, a storm drain system. So looking at this slide, if we go to a 75% build out, so we went from a natural setting, and then that slide that flipped to red was about a 50%. This is at about a 75%. So what used to be um, about 15% soaking to the ground is actually now, or used to be 50% soaking to the ground is now 15%. So we've dropped the amount of water that's infiltrating into our, uh, and recharging our groundwater. We still have a lot of evaporation happening through parking lot puddles and our urban forestry, but um, we now have 55% runoff. So it used to be 10% runoff, now it's 55% runoff. And that has a lot more uh, volume as well as velocity. So the speed and the muscle that that water is moving really has changed and picked up. And this is Fayetteville. Um, I, I took this picture flying in um, in January, back when we used to be able to go places. And um, so this is, um, you can see the stadium up in the, the corner there and the um, baseball stadium. Of course, um, the baseball stadium there. And then you'll see MLK Boulevard running through the, the kind of the heart of, of Fayetteville. That's a lot of impervious surfaces. There's a lot of big parking lots, rooftops, um, places that can't soak up that water. So we're looking at about a, a, above 50%, probably getting closer to that 75% build out in Fayetteville. And so that water flows into a storm drain system. Um, it is not the same set of pipes that go to a wastewater treatment plant. So when you're at home and you flush your toilet or use your sink or your laundry, that water goes to the wastewater treatment plant and gets treated before being released back to our um, creeks and streams. However, our storm drains, those openings in the streets, go straight to a creek or stream. It is a, a health and human safety device to get water away from our homes to keep them from flooding, away from our streets to keep them passable and navigable for emergency vehicles, um, and then to get that water sent as fast as possible away. Um, and so that way it goes right into a creek or stream. So whatever's on that street is gonna end up there in a creek. And so these are just some of the pollutants that can get in through stormwater. So we look at sediment um, that can get deposited um, and then becomes um, suspended in water, nutrients, litter, uh, bacteria from pet waste, pesticides and uh, chemicals that uh, Sarah mentioned earlier, and then automobile fluids. Those are our major pollutants that come in from our urban areas. And so one of the, the tools that we use to mitigate that is through managing our downspouts from our rooftops. So we can somehow um, take away that, that um, 
the potential of the rooftop being one of those impervious surfaces uh, to, to slow down that uh, stormwater. It's one of the tools we can use. And Sarah's going to explain just a little bit more on that. Yeah, so, you know, the reason why we use rain barrels to prevent that non-point source pollution really just comes down to the fact that that barrel is going to collect the water that's running off of your roof and instead of it going down a sidewalk or going down your driveway and directly into that storm drain you can actually use it on your lawn you can use it on your garden so you're putting it on some kind of vegetation that will allow it to soak in and infiltrate through the ground where it's not going to pick up those pollutants and take them directly to our streams and creeks so you will notice on your barrels that they have a hole up at the top. And that's going to be for an overflow because these barrels do fill up very quickly. Uh, a one inch rainstorm could quickly fill up that barrel entirely. But by having that overflow, which we will talk about a little bit more later, you can actually attach a hose to that as well. And you can put that into your garden or you can put that into your lawn. That way, once again, that water is not hitting that impervious surface and then just running and collecting pollutants and taking them directly into our creeks and streams. So we are gonna go ahead and get started with the assembly of your barrel right now. So if everybody wants to grab their supplies and get ready to go with their barrels. Uh, so before we even, you know, before you got these barrels, the thing that we typically do is if you were to come to a face-to-face -face workshop, we would have you cut off the top of the barrel, which we have already done for you. We would have you do that using a sawzall. We would also have you use a hole saw to cut a one and a half inch hole down at the bottom of your barrel for the spigot. And then at the top of your barrel, we would have you use a one inch drill to make a hole for that overflow valve. Then you would go through and you would actually scrub out your barrel with the hose outside. So we've actually taken care of those steps for you because we know not everybody has those tools. So Jane and I really, one day we just knocked all these barrels out. So this just kind of shows that we made holes in the top. Then we used a sawzall to be able to get that off. We punched those holes in using the hole saw in that one inch drill bit. And then we went around and we tried to clean up those edges a little bit. You may have noticed some of them can still be a little bit sharp. So definitely be careful with that. But so that's how we prepped those barrels for you and then got your supplies together. And Sarah also washed those uh, for us. Those are all food grade barrels. Um, if you're going to be repeating this um, uh, with other rain barrels, as we'd love for you to do, is, and keep adding to the collection. Um, they're a little addicting. They're like tattoos. Once you get one, you keep wanting more. Um, so keep adding to them. And um, so she washed those out for you. So just make sure they're food grade barrels. Um, and so sometimes they are a little sticky or they might have something inside of them. But that way it's still safe to use on your plants um, and you're not putting any harsh chemicals on there. All right, so now we're going to look at the parts and the pieces. So these are the things inside that little blue bag. And Sarah's going to click over this picture. Um, we asked you guys to grab either a crescent wrench. It's not totally necessary. You can use a rag. It's just something to hold on to that, um, to the overflow valve or overflow uh, piece when she um, will explain how to put that in. There's a plumber's tape there. That plumber tape, we, uh, Sarah already put on uh, the spigot for us. So we didn't supply, we didn't have to supply that to you. There wasn't really a good way to do that. So we just went ahead and put that on. Um, and then there's the bulkhead tank fitting. That is the black piece. That's kind of, uh, looks like, Little, it has two parts, a little untwist. Um, you'll see some screen and then you'll see some bungee cord. Um, and those are all very basic things you can find at most um, home improvement stores. Um, the bulkhead tank fitting, we had, you have to go to an agricultural supply store that's used for spray equipment. So that's the only specialized piece that you can't just pick up at any home um, supply uh, store or home improvement store. And then you'll see your barrels. Um, I would like to give a little shout out. Thank you uh, to uh, Pinnacle Foods. Um, and I think they got bought out by Cargill now, but they were Pinnacle Foods when we got the barrels. Um, and they're in South Fayetteville. They supply us um, uh, at no cost. So it's free, which is one of the reasons we're able to provide this workshop in a barrel at low cost to you. Um, and for additional barrels, um, the places that we that always have them in stock is a place called Hog Eye Pallet. It's um, actually, they have two locations, one's in Hog Eye and one's out toward Prairie Grove. 
um, or sorry, one ounce toward Elkins. And um, if you look them up online, Hog Eye Pallet, uh, they are usually around 20 to $22 a barrel. You can also find these pop up along um, roadsides a lot. Um, there's some bait and tackle shops. Um, there's one out by uh, Lake Sequoia in Fayetteville that uh, typically will have some in stock sometimes. Just really ask them if it's food grade barrels. Um, it's gonna be Google searching uh, and Facebook group searching, trying to find used food grade barrels. Absolutely. All right, so the first thing that you are going to do with your barrel is you are going to install that bulkhead. So if everybody can go ahead and grab their bulkhead. So that is going to go into that lower hole in the bottom. So here we've just got a quick video for you to show. So the nice, the fun thing about these bulkheads is that they are reverse threaded. So righty tighty is what we're all used to, righty tighty, lefty loosey, but with this, no. You are going to turn it to the left to tighten it and to the right to undo it. So what you're want, going to want to do is you're going to want to take the bolt shape. You're going to want to push that through at the bottom. There are two gaskets. The rubber one is going to stay on. It's going to go on the inside. And then the plastic washer you're going to put on the outside with that plastic gasket. And once again, you're going to tighten it going lefty tighty not righty tighty. So it is one of those things that can be pretty challenging no matter how many times we do this workshop. Uh, it can be really challenging to remember that you have to turn it to the left. It's got that reverse threading going on. So um, if anybody has any questions on the bulkhead installation, please feel free to ask right now or you can ask towards the end. I know it's, a, it's not the most arduous of tasks, but we wanna make sure that everybody gets it. And really, you just need to hand tighten it. It doesn't have to be over tightened. It's got that rubber gasket on the inside, so it's gonna make that nice watertight seal for you. So does anybody have any questions or anything? And remember, at this point, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can type something into the chat box. Otherwise, we can go, oh, go ahead. Do you keep it whole? You don't, you don't take it apart? You do take it apart. So what you will need to do is, I'll start this video back over too, because it kind of shows Jane. So you'll actually unscrew the plastic washer part from the bulkhead. So you're going to end up with three different parts in your hand. You're going to have the bolt part, you're going to have your plastic washer and your plastic gasket. The bolt shape goes into the barrel. You can see Jane doing that here. That plastic gasket will go on and then the plastic washer and you will turn it to the left to tighten it. This was the part we're really uncertain if people can follow for videos. This is the our takeaway from not doing it live. This is this yeah. is a real test here. And and this is great though. If you know, we we definitely want any information that you all have. So at the very end of this uh, presentation, we will also have a survey that will be in the chats that we would love for everyone to go to and fill out and let us know how we can make this workshop better, how you felt about this. Uh, you know, we want all of the input, absolutely. Um, and also you received that in an email that was sent to you and I'll send it out again as well. Um, does anybody have any other questions about how to install that bulkhead? Does it matter how tight you make the um, connection? Not really. It just needs to be as hand, hard hand tighten as you can. You don't need any special tools for it because that rubber gasket on the inside is going to be pushing up against your barrel. And so that'll be a nice tight seal. And because this is something that if you feel like it's a little bit too loose, if you're getting any leaking, you can just tighten it up a little bit more from the outside. Does anybody else have a question? Or if not, we'll go ahead and move on. All right, we'll move on to the next part. All right, so this is going to be installing the spigot. This one's pretty self-explanatory, but I want to give a caution before you start going into it. So that's got that plumber's tape wrapped around for you now. Mm -hmm. um, and your part should have that still 
still stuck to it. Um, and this is just kind of an extra precaution to make sure that um, that that water doesn't leak out around the, the spigot. Now before you put that in, this is a brass piece going into a plastic thread. So if you if you go to put that in there and it starts to give some hesitation, pause and, and kind of make sure, re, you know, kind of reverse it back out, make sure that it's going in correctly threaded because you can easily re-thread that plastic piece. So um, again, what you'll do is just put that the spigot um, right up to the um, to the bulkhead tank fitting and twist it in and um, it should fit right in there. There's there the same threads, so they should go right in. And then the outside of that's a garden hose adapter to that. So you can actually put a garden hose right up to it or use it to put into a, um, a bucket or a, a watering can. Um, a reminder to make sure to, to this is a, a cross valve spigot. So you just wanna make sure it, it is not perpen, um, parallel, but it needs to be perpendicular to turn it off. Um, so when it does rain again and you fill your barrel up, um, you won't be um, disappointed when you go outside and find your barrel empty because you forgot to turn it off <laughs> for that first time. And uh, just to let you know, these are, um, the quality on these are fine. I've had, I've been using these same barrels for 10 years, but uh, it is a, there are more expensive and uh, improved spigots out there. You can get a ball valve spigot that will um, allow more water to pass through at a faster rate so you can get a, a faster flow. So does anybody have any questions on this one or is everybody good to go? Spigots are installed. All right. All right. Now we will move on to the next part. So I gave Sarah is, the hard ones. <laughs> <laughs> so this will be installing that hose adapter. So before you get started, you'll see your hose adapter. I know my screen is pretty small, but there are two parts to it. There's one that's more finely threaded than the other. And the more finely threaded piece is what's actually going to go into the plastic at the top of your barrel. The one that's not as finely threaded is going to be for a garden hose to fit on there. So what you'll do is you'll take that and this is where either a wrench or a rag will come in handy because this can be very sharp. If you just start trying to put it on with your hand, you might you know, cut your finger. We all know like paper cuts on the fingers are the worst, but a brass uh, hose adapter cut is not great either. So with this one, whenever you tighten it in, the thing to remember is that this is an overflow valve. So this does not have to be watertight. You don't have to tighten this all the way in until it's completely flush in the middle. Um, it just is really there so that you can eventually add a hose to that and keep that water from the overflow from going against your foundation and you can lead it away from the house. So it does not have to be watertight. Uh, but you'll just want to make sure that you have it in there solidly so it doesn't fall out. Um, but of course, if it falls out, it's easy to just go ahead and put right back in. And you don't need a wrench for this. You can use a rag, you can use an oven mitt, just whatever you have laying around that's easy yeah. to grab onto this and to tighten it in. Um, does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions on installing that hose adapter? All right. So yeah, this is not, it. you know, it's not rocket science, but it's definitely one of those things that until you do it for the first time, it's kind of tricky to figure out exactly what you're needing to do. So we'll go ahead and move on to one of the last steps. So this is attaching the screen. So you should, in your blue bag, you would have a bungee. Um, and that bungee cord um, has knots tied at the end of it. Um, Oh, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> and so you'll take your screen and throw it over the top of your barrel. There should be overhang on all sides. And just take that bungee and wrap it around the top um, of your barrel so you're catching the lip of the barrel and making a tie. So the point of this is to keep the mosquitoes out because we don't want mosquitoes getting our barrels. So just do a slip knot. Take that and slip it right underneath there. Um, and, you know, hopefully it'll stay, but um, sometimes not so much. So that was our <laughs> blooper reel. <laughs> 
And I probably did that about four times before I actually got it to, <laughs> to get a good catch on it. So you slip it in there, kind of pull it, make a slip knot. Um, and again, this is something if you're doing it yourself, again, this was a way for us to make it more um, economical to be able to produce the barrels. You can go buy bungees that have the hooks already attached to them to make a, a, a more permanent seal. We used to use staples um, and we would cut the screen uh, to the circle and just staple it to the top of the barrel. But as we're talking about maintenance here in just a moment, that became, um, we have found from our participants in doing this workshop for the last 12 years is that it's gotten, um, people were complaining that it was hard to get the staples in and out and then having to restaple and then having to buy a new screen because of the staple holes. And we think this just is a better way of, of doing it. Um, and so again, just make sure that's nice and tight so the, there aren't any places for mosquitoes to be able to get in there. Does I've anybody, used, oh, go ahead. Good. I've used, um, you know, uh, bicycle tire hoses. <gasps> yes. Uh, the inner tube. Yes. Nice. And, uh, and, and that works really well too. You know, I actually used to live in East Africa and they um, use bicycle tire inner tubes for everything. It's there, <laughs> it's called Impira and we just used it for every single thing we could use it for. <laughs> So, and it can be a little bit tricky with this bungee. We tried to make it long enough, but also to where it would make that tight seal so mosquitoes couldn't get in. So really we just put those knots and we just kind of tucked it under, uh, but you kind of have to hold on to the connection point there when you're pulling down on the screen, because uh, unless you just find it really fun to shoot your bungee across the room multiple times, um, we, we definitely had a good time doing that until we got it settled, but uh, does everybody have that? Does anybody have any questions about attaching their screen to the barrel? Your slip knot instruction was uh, kind of vague. I didn't understand that knotting. The attach, okay. you attach those ends together. Right, so if you have two pieces that are, oh, sorry, you've got them right there, why don't you do Yes, so, so it's not necessarily a slip knot. Let's yeah. say my bottle is your barrel and I've got this. So you're just going to put one underneath the other. So it's almost like part of a box knot, um, yeah, like right. the first part. Okay. And so that way it really just sits there against it and holds the pressure on by being stretched out. Um, and you honestly, if you'd prefer, you can do the full box knot. So let me get rid of that so you can actually see this. So you've done one under. So we've got it like this. We go under. So now we have that. And then you can actually tie it all the way. So you've got just a little box knot. But the only thing with that is, you know, it's going to be very tight there on the top. So it may be a little bit more challenging to take off your bungee. Uh, we did look though, and at the home improvement stores around town, you can also just buy a kit that has the um, hooks. So if you'd prefer to buy hooks that you can put on there to kind of make it easier, uh, you could do that. And if you have zip ties, you could just use a zip tie around this and that will tighten it because it has the knots in it and it won't let it come off. So lots of different ways to do it. Just having a bungee to me is something that you absolutely need to make the maintenance easier on this. Um, so, you know, I absolutely understand that, that it can be a little bit of a challenge there. Um, and it looks like we did have a question here about which side of the brass piece goes in at the top. So you'll see here, oop, yeah, there you go. <laughs> in, uh, in my screen, if you can look at mine, this side is a lot more finely threaded. So there are a lot more of the threads on that side. Whereas on this side, there are only about three threads all the way because that one's the garden hose side. So you want to put the one in that's more finely threaded into the top of your barrel because otherwise you won't be able to attach a garden hose there. Does that make sense? And absolutely, if you, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to ask at any time. Um, so what, we're gonna talk just a little bit now, kind of about how to, now that you have your rain barrel put together, how are you actually going to use it? And then we'll talk about some maintenance as well. And then at the very end, we're just gonna open it up for any questions that you all might have. So. Awesome. 
I was going to point out that you guys did receive um, instructions, the rain barrel instruction sheets also inside those blue bags. Yes, absolutely. So inside your blue bag, you're going to have one of these, which is building your rain barrel. So this will give you some added instructions. And as I said, we are going to have this on our social media pages. So we can send out an email to all participants with that information. Um, and also just one last thing that at the very end of this during the question period, if you feel that you've got what you need, you're good to go, please just go fill out that survey and you are free to log off at any time. You don't have to wait for all of the questions. Uh, we just really greatly appreciate you all being here today. So now that you have your barrel and you've completed it, one of the first things to remember is that elevating your barrel is going to be your best bet. By elevating your barrel, you're going to get head pressure so that you can actually push water through your garden hose. So some people will just use cinder blocks and have it raised off the ground by that much. Some people will actually build a structure so that they can raise it up higher because the higher that you have that barrel, the more head pressure you're gonna get on it. So the easier it is going to be to get more pressure out of your garden hose. So you'll wanna make sure that you elevate that. Now you'll also want to attach a hose to that overflow. So if you have any spare garden hose laying around that maybe you ran over with the lawnmower and cut in half on accident, um, I know I'm guilty of having done that before. So if you have that, you can attach it to that overflow at the top of your barrel and just make sure that it's going into your lawn, it's going into your bushes, into your garden, somewhere where it's not just sitting on an impervious surface. And you wanna make sure that it's away from your house because that overflow is to help keep the water from just pouring down and ending up right on your foundation. So you want to elevate your barrel first, then you want to make sure to attach the garden hose to that overflow. Now, the installation of your rain barrel, it, there are multiple different ways to do it. Some people go through and they actually just cut off their downspout and they place their barrel underneath that and they call it good. Some people will actually completely detach the downspout and place their barrel under it. Uh, and then some folks will actually get a, I believe, Jane, it's called a flexa spout. Mm -hmm. And you can get that at your home store where you can actually take off the guttering and attach that instead. And it's flexible and you can actually just put it down on top of that screen so that you don't have to do any cutting to your guttering. Now, some people don't have guttering. And so during a rainstorm, basically wherever is the path of least resistance, wherever you have the most water flowing off of your uh, roof, you can also just put your rain barrel there as well and that should work just fine. Um, so Jane is going to go over a little bit of how to actually take care of your rain barrel and maintain it. Um, yes, I'm actually just answering a question in the, um, oh, in the chat <laughs> about someone mentioned Little Debbie. Yes, McKee Foods, um, they have uh, in the past donated barrels to us as well as I've heard them selling them at very low cost to people. Um, so give them a call. And they also have heard work with smaller pe people that just like with Pinnacle Foods, they want us to take 20 to 50 to 60 barrels at a time to make it worth their while. And I've heard at Little Debbie, you can go and just get a few barrels. Um, so for maintenance is, um, uh, I, this is a picture of my rain barrel, by the way, at my home. <laughs> and as you can see, it got a little frozen. So we're going to talk just a little bit about maintenance. One is algae growth. That's going to be your number one issue when it comes to maintenance. It's going to get nutrients into your water somehow. At some point, some, some birdie is going to have a, a little um, restroom break on your roof and that might wash into your water and so you're going to get nutrients in there and that's going to cause algae growth. The more sun it gets the faster the algae will grow. So typically if it's in a shady spot or if you got one of the blue opaque barrels it's not as the algae doesn't grow quite as fast or if you have a white barrel you might want to make sure you paint it with a plastic paint. Um, when you buy the paint just make sure it says made for plastic and put a base coat of that paint onto that plastic um, and um, then you can paint with a paint with acrylic paint outside of that plastic, but make sure your base coat is at least a, a plastic plastic paste paint, and so it'll stick to that paint um, or stick to the barrel. And so, as you can see, this was one that I this one's probably ten years old, and you can see where some of the gray the green paint starting to to wash off of this one now. So um, again, this is a, a pretty a pretty old barrel. It's been it's been through a lot. Um, and then tannins from leaf litter. Um, so I typically take off the top of my screen. 
and I'll take a broom, take a rag around the, the edge of the broom and just use the broom to scrub the inside of the barrel. Um, even just a high pressure water hose sprayer sometimes can knock most of that um, algae and grit off. Um, and then also is um, you can just turn it upside down and, and wash that water out um, when you disconnect them. Um, and I would like to point out that that is a flexi spout that I have going into the top of that barrel as well. It looks kind of like an accordion. Um, so yeah, linen, tannins from leaf litter is another uh, thing that can get into the water. So if you have open guttering and uh, you especially get a lot of water sitting in those leaves, um, then it, it creates the oak uh, can get tannins in there. Um, yes, the top hose is for the overflow. You can see actually right there is where the garden hose is coming out of the rain barrel. Um, and I have a broken um, garden hose that I've stuck up there. And that's where that overflows right into a, a, a some landscaping plants that I have. Um, and so those tannins will turn the water brown color um, and it has a smell to it, but it's not going to hurt your plants um, as well as the algae. Actually, some of those nutrients can be beneficial for some of the plants you're putting them on there, but eventually it'll get pretty gross and pretty smelly and you're going to want to clean those out. Um, mosquitoes, you don't want this to become a, a haven for mosquitoes. As long as that screen is intact and in place, you are good to go. But if for some reason, say the guttering um, bumps up against the screen and it, it cuts the screen or something happens where that screen breaks, you need to re get it replaced um, in the spring or summer pretty quickly or mosquitoes will take place um, or start um, laying their larvae in there really, really quickly and you'll get a mosquito problem. During the winter months, um, it depends on what you are going to use in the water for. I use my water year round. Um, I could have prevented some of this problem by actually draining the water when I knew there was a hard freeze coming. I could have released the water and let the water level down, giving it room to expand. It's possible that when the water freezes, it can bevel out the bottom of your rain barrel or most likely it's going to split the screen at the top of your rain barrel. Either way, you don't want that to happen. So let the water level down before it freezes. Um, and then once it, it, the water, the temperatures go back up here, you know, it's north of Arkansas. We don't get harsh winters where we're looking at long term freezes. It was probably 70 degrees the next day after this picture. Um, that water is going to melt back down and you can use it again. Um, but if you're not going to be using your rain barrel during the winter and you don't want it to deal with that, um, you can just winterize that spot. If you had a downspout, put it back on. Um, if you use that flexus spout, you can just let it hang um, and, and have a normal, um, what would normally be there for a winter time and take your barrel and turn it upside down so you're not just filling it up with, with water. Okay, so really that's that's kind of the basics of it. At this point, if anybody has any questions, if they would like to put anything in the chat box or unmute themselves and ask questions, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Remember, Jane put in the chat box there, there is a link to the Qualtrics survey, which will just give us some information on what you thought about this workshop, anything that you think we needed to include. We'd greatly appreciate it if everyone would fill that out. And I will make sure that we also send out an email with that link. As I said, we are going to be putting this video onto Facebook um, and YouTube. So if you wanna share it with anyone, feel free to do it from there. And I've included both of our email addresses here in case you would prefer to ask us a question through email. But at this point, you are either free to log off or if you have any questions and you'd like to stick around, we are happy to answer.